How many of you know God did it? How many of you really know God did it? How many of you really believe that God did it? How many of you believe that God can do it? If you really believe God can do it, stand on your feet and give God some praise. Everybody go to take the concept of praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. I told you Simon Temple is loud, ain't it? Amen. And to our visitors, this is normal when our pastor's here. And prior to our pastor, when Bishop Thompson was here, it's just normal. Isn't that right, Simon Temple? Amen. We're supposed to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And on that note, we want to thank God for our choir, for our band, for the ushers, for the ambassadors, for the greeters, for the deaconess for the acolytes, for the ministerial staff. And why do we want to thank God for that? Because we're one body with many members, and it takes all of us doing our part. Amen? That's what keeps the body of Christ moving forward. Amen? Amen. I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Praise the Lord. And I give honor to our pastor, the Reverend Dr. Keith D. Tillett and Lady Carrie Tillett, the shepherd of this house. We thank God so much for them. Amen. Amen. We have been blessed as we go into, we're rounding out this conference year. Amen. And we have truly been blessed. We don't have, but what is it, September, October? Yeah, we don't have but a few more months. And then we're going into a whole new conference year. Just think about it. God done kept us through two and a half years of COVID-19. Amen. Thank God. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're going to move right along. Okay. All right. All right. Our text is Romans chapter 8, and I will be reading verses 33 uh, through 35. And I'm reading from the Christian Standard Bible. And it reads, who can bring an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sorrow? Hmm. The sermon ideal I will be speaking to you from on this morning is you have God-given divine advantages. You have God-given divine advantages. Let us pray. Father Almighty, in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ, I pray that you would use me in such a way, Lord, that it would glorify you, edify your people, and help to convert souls to Christianity. I pray, Lord, that as your word goes forth, it does not return unto you void. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. All right. Okay. Here we are. Let's get started. I told you, God is doing something new in me, and I refuse to stop his work. Amen? Now, According to one source, the secret to a good sermon is to have a good beginning and a good end and to keep them as close together as possible. <laughs> now, I'm going to try to follow that guidance, Reverend Anderson. Nonetheless, here we go. Again, you have God-given divine advantages. 
Listen, one website defines the word advantage as a condition or circumstance that puts one in a favorable or superior position. Is there anybody in here that believes they're in a favorable position right now? Anybody? Amen? I know I am. So what does it look like to have an, the advantage over something? Lou Nichols gives the following example of what it looks like to have the advantage in a game of golf. Any golf players out there? He says this, one day a very arrogant pro golfer was approached by a man wearing dark sunglasses and carrying a white cane who offered to play him for $100 a hole. Well, I can't play you, you're blind, aren't you? The pro golfer stated. Yes, I am, replied the blind man, but that's all right. I was a state champion before I went blind. I think I can beat you hands down. Now, the pro golfer had not been doing so well financially, so he needed the money. Therefore, the golfer begins to think to himself, blind or not, okay, if the guy was crazy enough to challenge me, then why not? The pro golfer then said to the blind man, you did say $100 a hole, right? The blind man nodded, yes, I did. Well, all right, replied the pro golfer, it's a deal. But don't say I didn't warn you about losing your money. Then the pro golfer said to the blind man, when would you like to play? The blind man said, any night at all, brother, any night at all. <laughs> Since this brother was blind, right, playing golf in the dark gave him the advantage over the pro golfer who was used to playing golf during the day. Aren't you glad that Jesus gave us the advantage of having spiritual sight over spiritual blindness? How many of you can clearly see and understand the gospel of Jesus Christ? If you can, that's an adv a divine advantage worth giving God thanks for. Amen? And if God has done anything for you, you can shout right now, thank you, Jesus. Yeah, because he's done a great deal for us. Amen? As we continue on, would you agree there are many people in this world who believe their massive amount of wealth gives them the advantage in this life? And from a natural mindset, come on, Master Life, I'd say I agree, but from a renewed mindset, I'd say I strongly disagree. Why? Because the Bible states in Mark chapter 8, verse 36, for what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? In other words, a person could have all the money in the world without a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and be at a disadvantage in this life and an eternal disadvantage in the life to come. Therefore, we all have a need to gain more knowledge and understanding of those God-given divine advantages that have been freely, freely, freely given to us. You see, keep in mind, the purpose of this message is to give you more knowledge and understanding of some God-given divine advantages you have obtained because of the favorable position you now possess with God the Father through his son, Jesus the Christ. Now, in reading the book of Romans, written by the Apostle Paul, it is important to realize this, that Paul declared to the church in Rome, salvation is available to all Jews and Gentiles, that be us, no matter their social or economic status in life. Furthermore, Paul contended that all are saved by grace through faith in the finished work <clears throat> of Jesus Christ on the cross and his resurrection. And even more importantly, Paul asserted this. It is only through woo, Jesus Christ that we can stand before God on judgment day and be found not guilty. <clears throat> So what are some of those God-given divine advantages that we have obtained because of our personal relationship with Jesus Christ that are found in our text? Mm -hmm. This message right here will reveal at least three God-given divine advantages located in our text. First, you have a God-given 
divine advantage over the enemy's accusations. Okay? Webster Dictionary defines the word accusation as the act of charging someone with a crime or offense or the act of accusing someone of any wrongdoing or injustice. Anybody ever been accused of something before? As you already know, accusations can be found to be true or false in a court of law. With this in mind, Paul asked the following rhetorical question in verse 33 of Romans chapter 8. Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? Now, to understand the thrust behind this question by Paul, we must pay close attention to what Paul said in the verses leading up to this question. You see, Paul said in verse 31 and 32 of Romans chapter 8, What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He did not even spare his own son, brothers and sisters, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him grant us everything? Yeah, thank you. you see, in other words, Paul was saying that God proved he was for those who had a personal relationship with his son, Jesus Christ, in Rome when he made the decision to give his one-of-a-kind son up yeah. to sinful man to be crucified on a rugged cross. Yeah, Why do you think God did such a thing? It was because of his unconditional love for all who would put their trust in his son's crucifixion, death, burial, and resurrection. Let me explain. When Paul said in verse 33, who can bring an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Paul already knew that any charge of sin against those who had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ would never prevail against them in the courtroom of heaven. Why? Well, let us hear what Paul said in Romans 8 and verse 30 regarding this matter. Paul said this, And those he predestined, he also called. In those he called, he also justified. In those he justified, he also glorified. You see, in other words, in Paul's mind, Jesus Christ had already pronounced a verdict in the courtroom of heaven of not guilty for those who are in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, therefore, if God is for you, what accusation can stand against you in this life and especially in the courtroom of heaven? Not one, says Jesus Christ, who is the advocate with the Father in heaven on our behalf. You see, let us listen again to Romans chapter 8, verse 33. It says, so that we can hewn out of first, the first God-given advantage, this verse states this. Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Did you hear that, Simon Temple? God is the one who justifies. God is the one who what? Justifies. God has given us the advantage of justification over the enemy's accusations. You see, we have already been justified by God. That's right, before God laid the foundations of the heavens and the earth, he decreed that all who would believe in his son's crucifixion, death, burial, and resurrection would be declared not guilty of sin in his courtroom of heaven. To prove this point, the Bible states in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, even before the world was made, think about that for a moment, God had already chosen us to be his through our union with Christ so that we will be holy and without fault before him. Touch yourself and say, I'm without fault before God. Think about that. That's how God sees you, holy and without fault. You see, how many of you are grateful for the advantage of justification over accusations? I know I am. Now, how can we show God in this moment that we are grateful to him? Can we give God praise for the advantage of justification over accusations? Amen. Yeah, because if you really understand that, you'd be praising the Lord right now. Amen. Anybody happy that God chose and saved them? Can we tell Jesus, thank you for choosing and saving us? Jesus will save your soul if you let him. 
And I feel like the Williams brothers had it right when they said, I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody who can save anybody. Come on, Simon. Hey, man. Since God has justified us, right, we have been placed in a favorable position with him. That favorable position is none other than right standing relationship with Jesus Christ. And as a result of that, our enemy, the devil, is angry and he makes accusations against us day and night. For the Bible states in Revelations 12 and verse 10, then I heard a loud voice in the heavens say, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. But thank God, but thank God, but thank God because he has already declared us not guilty by the blood of the Son, Jesus the Christ. An example of what it's like to be declared not guilty can be seen in the following that is told of Merlin Carruthers, the author of the book Prison to Praise. Merlin had firsthand experience of what it was like to be declared not guilty. During World War II, he joined the army. Who? Airborne, all the way. Anxious to get into some action, Merlin went AWOL. We don't do that but was caught and sentenced to five years in prison. Instead of sending him to prison, the judge, now the judge told him he could serve his term by staying in the army for five years. The judge told him if he left the army before the five years ended, he would have to spend the rest of his five-year sentence in prison. Merlin was released from the army before the five-year term had passed, so he returned to the prosecutor's office to find out where he would be spending the remainder of his sentence. To his surprise and delight, Merlin was told that he had received a full pardon from President Truman. The prosecutor explained, that means your record is completely clear, just as if you had never gotten involved with the law. You see, Simon Temple, through Jesus the Christ, he did the same thing for us when he gave us the divine advantage of justification over accusations. That means your record and my record has been completely cleared of any accusation brought against us. In other words, although an accusation is formed against us, it shall not prosper against us. For the Bible says in Isaiah 54 and 17, no weapon, that is, no weapon formed against thee shall prosper. In every tongue, every tongue, every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Any service in here for the Lord. If you are, it applies to you. Amen? So what should we do with this advantage of justification over accusations? We can remember that God has completely washed our record clean of any accusation the devil or anybody else might bring against us so that we can what? Serve him and his people freely. Yeah, yeah. Now that we have heard what the first God-given divine advantage is, let us hear the second. Secondly, you have a God-given divine advantage over feelings of condemnation. Yeah. For this message, the word condemnation is defined as being found guilty by God of sin in the courtroom of heaven, resulting in a sentence of eternal separation from God forever. You see, with this in mind, Paul asked the question in Romans 8 and 34. Who is the one who condemns? Then he follows this rhetorical question with, Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. This verse gives a brief description of what Jesus Christ came to do for us, my brothers and sisters, 
and where he is presently. In addition, this verse gives the answer to the second God-given divine advantage. To explain, the text gives at least three reasons as to why no one, no one can condemn or find those guilty of sin who are chosen by God. Mm -hmm. The first reason is Christ died for us. The second reason is Christ is risen and is now seated at the right hand of God the Father. And he has all power in heaven and on earth. And the third reason is Christ is interceding on our behalf. If Jesus is praying for you, you know God the Father is going to answer that prayer. Amen? Amen. So are you ready to hear what the second God-given divine advantage is? Come a little closer. The second is God's forgiveness. This may not sound so important to some right now, but it will become extremely important for those who have rejected Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior during the great white throne judgment. You see, on the other hand, for those of us who have been saved by grace through our faith in the finished works of Jesus Christ on the cross, God has given us the divine advantage over the great white throne judgment. How so, you may ask? Whereas those whose sins have not been forgiven on judgment day, will be at a disadvantage. Those of us who have received forgiveness from Jesus Christ will be at a divine advantage. Yeah, let me explain that one. Being forgiven of your sins by God renders the second death powerless because you already have eternal life abiding in you through the Holy Spirit of which you have been sealed with until the day of your complete redemption. To prove this point, the Bible states in Revelation chapter 20, verse 6, listen carefully, blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. Why? Because the second death has no power over them but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. How many of you all want to reign with Jesus Christ? I know I do, amen? Yes, Lord. I don't want to reign with the devil, amen? He won't be reigning anyway. At this time, he's going to be in the bottomless pit. Anyhow, since we have the divine advantage of forgiveness over condemnation, we can serve God without feeling guilty because God has wiped our sin record clean for the Bible declares in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18 God says this come now let us settle the matter says the Lord though your sins are like scarlet they shall be as white as snow though they are red as crimson they shall be like wool that makes me happy To get a better understanding of this God-given divine advantage called forgiveness, one writer explains it this way. We all have seen and used those little electronic calculators. Now, do you remember what happens if you get your information confused or make an error? You simply press clear, the clear button, and automatically all of the information is eliminated from the calculator. Then you begin again without trying to sort out the previous mistake. In fact, there is no record of your mistake. It is lost forever. Yeah, that's what happens to our sins when God forgives us. The consequences may remain, but the guilt, the legal condemnation for the offense is gone because God has pressed the clear button and to those who might be struggling yes Lord with feelings of condemnation because you have committed an act of sin listen to the following encouraging not condemning encouraging words from the Bible on this matter 
the Bible says this in Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, therefore, one more time, therefore, y'all want to say it with me? Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because through Jesus Christ, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Hmm. So how does this God-given divine advantage of forgiveness over condemnation apply to our personal relationship with Christ? Hmm. Well, according to Romans chapter 6, verse 14, there is no condemnation for God's true children. Because we are no longer under the law. That means you don't have to obey the law to be saved, but you still obey the commandments. Okay, let's get that straight. In fact, Romans 7 and 6 teaches us that God has actually, watch this, released us from the requirements of the law so that we can now serve him in the newness of the Holy Spirit. So anytime you begin to feel condemned because you have sinned, confess your sin to God, ask God for forgiveness. Now watch this because this is real important. Receive your forgiveness because you have a lot of uh, forgiveness stored up in Jesus Christ. You got to receive it, right? And watch this. Then encourage yourself by saying to yourself, that's right, talk to yourself and say, I am the righteousness of God. Tell yourself, I am the righteousness of God. Matter of fact, touch yourself on your head, on your chest, wherever, and say, declare, I am the righteousness of God. Why? For the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, listen at this. God made him, that's Jesus, who had no sin, to what? Be sin. Why? So that in him we might become what? The righteousness of God. Amen. Amen. Now that we have heard the second God-given divine advantage, let us hear the last. And I'm going to do it. I've been around Reverend Sharon Newton a little too long, y'all. Amen. But it's good. Boy, it's going good. Boy, I am happy. I ain't never been this happy in my life. Now, that ain't a knock on nobody. That's just an Ephesians 3 and 20 moment. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than you could think, ask, or imagine. I mean, you can have love, but God can take you into a deeper love. Does everybody understand that? Amen. Thank you. Okay. All right, okay, okay, here we go. All right, here we go. Lastly, you have a God-given divine advantage, watch this, over feelings like you have been separated from God. Since we are the body of Christ, can we be real with each other in this moment? How many of you would agree that in some of our human experiences in life, there have been times when you felt separated from God. Yeah. Even Jesus, who was fully human and fully God, encountered this human experience. If you recall, the Bible records in Matthew 27 and 46, at about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, sabbatine, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Even Jesus felt separated. And to this point, if you recall, in verse 35 of our text, Paul asked the question, here we go, who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or the sword? Oh, y'all just participating today. Hallelujah. Please understand, Paul had experienced, watch this, each of these difficulties in his walk with Jesus Christ according to his own testimony in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 to 29. And as one writer puts it, right, 
Paul wanted to show his readers in the church at Rome that suffering, listen carefully, suffering does not separate believers from Christ and that suffering actually carries them along toward their ultimate goal. Suffering actually carries you toward the ultimate goal. What is the ultimate goal? The ultimate goal is to become more like Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. So you say, Lord, why am I going through this? To develop one of the fruit of the Spirit. If you don't know the fruit of the Spirit, learn them. Because they will answer the question as to why you're going through what you're going through. For a lot of us, God is teaching us patience. And self-control. Why? Because Jesus was patient. And he was very, 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 very self-controlled. Amen? All right, y'all done made me lose my spot. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So, what is it that God, what is that God given divine advantage that we've obtained to help us deal with feelings like we have been separated from God when we experience suffering? Here it is. Gaining knowledge and understanding of God's unconditional love is what helped Paul to overcome feeling like he had been separated from God. To be real, God hates our sin. Don't get it twisted. But he loves us anyway. You see, for example, we can be unfaithful to God, but God will always be faithful to us. We can be bad to God, but God will always be good to us. Oh, church, we can be unkind to God, but God will always be kind to us. Uh, We can be unavailable to God, but God will always be available to us. Oh, look, we can be unloving towards God, but God will always be what, Reverend Van Dyke? Loving towards us. God loves us unconditionally because God is love. Now, who in here are out there watching virtually wouldn't want to be in a personal relationship with a God who loves unconditionally? Mm. For example, a story is told that on one Sunday morning, a little boy looked up at his dad and asked, Daddy, how does God love us? His father answers, son, God loves us with an unconditional love. The little boy thought for a moment and then asked, Daddy, what kind of love is unconditional love? After a few minutes of silence, his father answered, do you remember the two boys who used to live next door to us and the cute little puppy they got last Christmas? Yes, sir, the son replied. Do you remember how they used to tease it? throw sticks at it, and even rocks at it? Yes, sir, the son replied. Do you also remember how the puppy would always greet them with a wagon tail and would try to lick their faces? Yes, sir, the son replied. Well, that puppy had unconditional love for those two boys. They certainly didn't deserve his love for them because they were mean to him. Yet he loved them anyway. The father then made his point. Here it is. God's love for us is also unconditional. Men threw rocks at his son Jesus and hit him with sticks, then even killed him. Yet Jesus loved them anyway. You see... This is why, my brothers and sisters, I believe Paul was able to state with such confidence. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation 
will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now that's a hallelujah moment right there. Amen. So how can we apply the knowledge of this God-given divine advantage to our lives, right? First, we can reject any feelings that lead us to believe we are separated from God when we experience, listen at this, momentary sufferings because they don't last forever. And remember, God promised he'll never leave us or what? Forsake us. Secondly, we can accept by faith everything the Bible teaches concerning God's unconditional love. And it starts from Genesis, and it runs clean on through Revelations. Church, the world doesn't know about God's unconditional love, which puts them, watch this, at a disadvantage no matter how successful they might be in life. Therefore, to help them receive these God-given divine advantages, we must tell them about a man who was 100, who is, not was, who is 100% God and 100% man and loves them unconditionally. Now that we have heard the final God-given divine advantage, let us close with this. Listen carefully. In closing, a story is told on August the 16th, 1987. Northwest Airlines Flight 225 crashed just after taking off from the Detroit airport, killing 155 people. One person survived, a four-year-old from Temp, Arizona, and her name was Cecilia. News accounts say when rescuers found Cecilia, they did not believe she had been on the plane. Investigators first assumed Cecilia had been a passenger in one of the cars on the highway until which the airliner crashed. But when the passenger reg register for the flight was checked, there was Cecilia's name. Cecilia survived because even as the plane was falling, Cecilia's mother, Paula, unbuckled her own seatbelt got down on her knees in front of her daughter, wrapped her arms and body around Cecilia, and then would not let her go. You see, nothing could separate that child from her mother's love. Neither tragedy, nor disaster, neither the fall, nor the flames that followed, neither height nor depth, neither life nor death. Such is the love of our Savior for us. Watch this. He unbuckled himself from his throne that is located at the right hand of God the Father. He descended from heaven, lowered himself down to us. Then he covered us with his own body and blood to save us. Yes, this example further reiterates the fact that nothing, nothing, tell your neighbor nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is where our divine advantages in this life originate from. And I believe Charles Wesley said it best when he wrote, and Sister Wilson probably knows this song, Jesus, lover of my soul, let me to thy bosom fly while the nearer waters roll. While the tempest still is high, hide me, O oh my Savior, hide till the storm of life pass. Safe into the haven, God, O oh, receive my soul at last. Amen, somebody. Praise the Lord. And as I wrap this up, I got to give this tribute. As a reminder, we have God-given divine advantages in this life because of our personal, lifelong relationship with Jesus Christ. First, if you recall, you have a God-given divine advantage of justification over the devil's accusations. How many of you remember presiding elder Henry A. Gregory, Jr.? Yes. If you remember, amen, he used to always say, I'm glad about it. 
well to pay tribute to him since he was a great man of God and my first presiding elder. In his very words, I'm glad about these God-given divine advantages. Church, are you glad about it too? Amen. And with that, secondly, you have a God-given divine advantage of forgiveness over feelings of condemnation. Don't forget that. I'm glad about that too, my brothers and sisters. I hope you are too. And thirdly, you have a God-given divine advantage over God's un over feeling uh, separated from God because of the divine advantage he gave you, which is unconditional yeah. love. Yeah. Amen? And can I tell you something else that I'm really, 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 really glad about. God gave me another divine advantage on May the 28th, 2022. And her name is none other than the Reverend Sharon B. Newton. And I'm really happy about that. Amen. And on that note, we want to thank everybody for your prayers, your, your, present, your presence, and all that. Amen? And again, don't doubt God. God is able to, boy, look at here, blow your mind with some stuff. All you got to do is remain faithful and trust him. And he going to do what he said he was going to do in your life anyway. Even if he got to drag you along. Even if you got to go kicking and scratching, God is still going to fulfill his purpose in your life. Let us pray. Father Almighty, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we thank you for your word that went forth. Lord, we pray that this word will become a part of our lives. Now, Lord, there may be someone in here among us that does not know you in the pardon of their sins. We simply ask that you will give them the strength, the grace, and the heart to come forth when the call to discipleship is made. Lord, thank you for hearing our prayers, and may you continue to bless our pastor, Lady Tillon, and his family, Lord. Keep them safe. Continue to uh, work in them to will and to act according to your good purposes, Lord. Thank you so much for this opportunity. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Would you please stand to your feet? You. Amen. And as you stand to the feet, to your feet, go ahead and give God a hand. Pray. God has been good to us on the day. Amen. Yes, He has. Ah, thank you so much for your support. Now, we come to the part of the worship service where there's a call and a response. Amen. There may be someone among us, a brother or a sister, doesn't matter how old you are, doesn't matter what you did last night, last week, even before you came here. You might even smell like weed and alcohol. I don't know. I don't smoke weed, I don't smoke weed and I don't drink plenty of alcohol, so look what the Lord did for me. Amen? He can do it for you too. Now, that was before I joined the military. Let me get that straight right now. Statue of Limit, before I joined the military. But nonetheless, God, amen, amen, Reverend Knight. God wants to show you his unconditional love right now. And he's willing and ready to forgive you of your sins right now. I would ask you to bow your heads just for a moment before we prepare for communion. And if you're watching virtually and you are sincere about giving your life to the Lord, just read those, that prayer. Uh, of salvation that's on the screen and once you do that we ask that you would call the church office the number will follow that uh, in a moment now if you are in here among us and you do not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ because this is something that you have to be certain of you can't be in doubt of this because it's the Holy Spirit that bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God and if you don't have that witness from the Holy Spirit most likely you're not saved. Now Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 7 verse 21. He said many on that day are going to say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not do mighty wonderful works in your name? Now these are people that are going to tell Jesus that on judgment day. And he's going to say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never, never knew you. It don't have to be that way for you. Brother, sister, we ask that you come forth and surrender your life to the Lord. Don't listen to the voice of the enemy because the enemy will be in your mind saying, you ain't got to go up there right now. You know what you did last night. You got more time. The Bible teaches us tomorrow, truly, yeah, truly, yeah. is not promised to us. 
the Bible says, today when you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Will you come? Will you come? If you know I'm talking to you, just raise your right hand. If you know that you don't have a relationship with the Lord, raise your right hand, and we will lead you to Jesus Christ. Will there be one? Will there be one? Will there be two? We know you're in here. My spirit fills you in here. Will you come, my brother, sister? Will you come? Listen, there's nothing to be ashamed of, okay? We all have had to do this, one way or the other. And we want you to know that we love you. We're not going to look at you no kind of way. We want to welcome you to the body of Christ. We want you to be saved. God wants to save you today. And the only thing that's stopping him from doing it today because he's not going to force himself on you. He's standing at your heart and he's knocking. All you got to do is let him in. Will you come? Will you come? Will you come? Will you come? Amen. All right. Well, let's give God a hand praise, and you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Now we will move right on to communion. Now, if you're in here and, and you wanted to give your life to the Lord and you felt like, well, it's just too many people in there, you can see one of our ministers. Just walk up to one of them after the service, and they will lead you to Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Okay, if anyone sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus the Christ, who is the righteous. He's the atoning sacrifice for our sins, but not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. Wherefore, you who do truly and honestly repent of your sins and are in love and harmony with your neighbor and intend to live a new life, walking uh, in his holy ways and henceforth obeying his commandments, draw near with faith, devoutly kneeling, making your humble confession to Almighty God. If the ministers haven't been served yet, we'll serve the ministers first, okay? And then if there are any ministers out in the Reverend Williams out, please come to the altar. We'll serve the ministers. We only have two tables today, right? And uh, the ushers will line you up and you'll go, you'll go, uh, the ushers will give you direction from each side, amen. And uh, let me give the benediction. So that once you take communion, I would ask you to be, think about this is Labor Day weekend, right? Please be safe. It's a lot going on, you all. Be alert of your environment. Amen? May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be among you and remain with you always. Amen.